Anyone here that doesn't know anything about C Sharp? Okay, looks like I'm the only one. And anyone here who has experience with Kafka? Okay, so if you are on one of those sites, okay, you still have time to go to another room, okay, because maybe we will not teach you, I will not teach you a lot of things, but if you decide to stay, uh, what I can promise is that I will try to give you a good time here and maybe teach you one or two things. So, my name is Guilherme Ferreira. It turns out that Guilherme is a really hard name to pronounce if you don't speak Portuguese, so feel free to call me Guy, okay? You can even find me as Guy on a lot of places, so it's a good way to start. One thing that I believe you should know about me is that I have a no habit that when I go to a different country, I always like to look for things that we have in common, things that connect my country, Portugal, to that place. So this time, I did the same regarding Portugal and England. And we have a lot of things in common, okay? Um, for, I'm not sure if you know, but port wine has a huge relationship with, uh, with England. But also, I could find this interesting fact. We have the oldest alliance in the world. Anyone know about that? Yeah, so you, you can win a prize if you go to, to one of those trivia contests. So in 1386, we got together and we created the uh, base of the relationship that we have nowadays, collaboration and peace. And on that treaty, I, I was curious, what was the definition of that treaty that made us be so successful in this relationship for such a long time? And I could found this document. This is the actual document or artifact. I'm not sure how we should name this kind of thing that is currently stored in Portugal. And here we state a lot of things that are important, like uh, typical of the ages that uh, a Portuguese king should marry a British princess and things like that. But also I have found this section that I'm really concerned about it. And I believe that I need to share with you what is here. Anyone here knows Latin? No? But Google Translate does. And according to Google Translate, this says that the evaluation of a Portuguese individual must always be conducted with a green card. Not sure if you know what does that mean, but it means that on the way out, you need to vote with a green card, otherwise this will end. Okay? Once again, thank you all for taking the time to be here with me today. I want to explain you what we'll be doing here uh, during this session. And when I started learning Kafka, I was joining a company that used Kafka as an event-driven solution, okay, to build event-driven architectures. And I decided that um, I wanted to learn, and usually I, I like to go to YouTube and find good talks in NDC and other conferences about the subject that I'm trying to learn. And what I realized is that most talks on Kafka were not targeting me on that scenario, okay? They were basically going through a lot of features of Kafka, but they will go from the basics to things that usually you will not need, uh, at least as a developer, often you need them in the perspective of a data engineer. I'm talking about things like Kafka Connect or Kafka Streams. So I was looking for the basics, okay? And I wanted to see a talk with a, a real example where the person share his pains during the process of developing that thing. So I decided to create that talk, that talk that I couldn't find. So this is a talk for C Sharp developers where we will see a lot of code, we will see architecture diagrams, we will talk about how to address certain problems that you'll find in event-driven applications, and we will do that without uh, slides, okay? We'll see code and architecture diagrams. I hope that you are comfortable with that, okay? So, what problem, what real problem is that one that I want to share with you? I'm not sure if anyone here knows, but I'm in fact a small content creator, okay? And when I say small, this is not a joke about how tall I am. I'm in fact small, okay? I don't have a lot of followers or subscribers or whatever. In fact, in August last year, I started my YouTube channel. I finally got my 2,000 subscribers, so both clap for me. And but there's one cool thing that I really like about my YouTube channel. Let me show you that. If you go to, let me open in my browser. If you go to YouTube and you search by Guy Ferreira, you will see not only me doing stupid faces, like a YouTuber should do, but also I'm sharing the stage with a Brazilian singer that has beautiful love songs. And I would like to share some of these 
with you. Maybe you will like it, okay? For example, this one, and let me move a bit forward. Can we have the sound a bit louder? No? Can we have the sound a bit? You can see the type of music that this is. So, I don't know if anyone here knows Portuguese, but what he's saying is, is a music about making love. So, this is the type of thing that you don't get when you search for Nick Shapsas online, okay? <laughs> so. Okay, so, as I told you, I will not be using slides. So I will be using my browser a lot. And one thing that I wanted to share with you is that as a content creator, you quickly understand that is not sustainable, okay? You do a lot of things, you, you like what you do, you like to teach, but um, your wife will ask you where all does that will pay the bills, right? And I don't have a good answer for that. So I decided to do what everyone does. I start my Patreon account, okay? I have a Patreon account. And it's from this Patreon account that you'll build an event-driven architecture, okay? An event-driven system. By the way, last slide, I promise. If anyone decides to become a patron during the talk, I brought you something special from Portugal, okay? And by the end, I will have a, a prize, okay? If no one decides to do that, you will ruin my demo, okay? So shame on you. Okay. By the way, um, let's keep, let's keep mov moving on. So. Patron, that is, as I was t telling you. My idea from Patron is not only that people can support me, okay, is one of the main roles of Patron, but also to give them access to stuff. Stuff that I don't know nowadays what will be, okay? My first idea was, okay, let me give access to source code, okay? Source code that will be hosted on GitHub, as it should be. So I need to have a way that I get a new Patron and I will, and that patron will land into a GitHub account, okay, into a GitHub organization. But that brings a lot of problems. For example, one of them is that I can't have, get a username by, for GitHub from an email, okay? So I need to have some things here in the middle. The other thing that I have found out that is really painful is working with the patron API. It's really a mess. Poor documentation, um, don't trust the documentation at all. So you will learn a lot of things trying, trying to do that. So th what I decided to do was, let me show you the first diagram that we have to see today, was my first step was basically this, okay? I have Patreon on that side, I want to look for that API, and they, they have one good thing, that is they, they have webhooks, so I can subscribe to um, members created, members updated, things like that. And then I will have an Azure function there, okay? And that Azure function, we'll write data to Kafka, okay? I will explain what does that mean, okay? What is important for you to know is that since I don't trust the Patreon API, okay, because I really don't trust them because I followed the documentation until the moment I had the first Patreon and I realized that it was all a lie, okay? And I need to, to change a lot of things now to cope with it. So I know that I will have that, that Azure function acting as an HTTP trigger and I want to write to Kafka. So the first question, where do I host Kafka? Yeah, common question. I can install it on Docker, I can install it on my machine, I can install it on whatever server I want, AWS, Azure, whatever. What I decided to do was using this thing, let me just zoom in for your benefit, Confluent Cloud. Confluent Cloud, by the way, I don't work for Confluent. Uh, most talks about, Confluent, about Kafka are from Confluent, I don't work for them. Confluent Cloud, is um, a kind of a platform as a service, right? Uh, that will give you Kafka. The benefit is that since I'm the only person working in this organization, I, I don't want to be installing Kafka and configuring a lot of things, so why not? The benefit of Confluent Kafka is that when you create your cluster, that is your first concept of Kafka, you have a cluster for Kafka, you can always decide, and I think you should be able to read here, where do you want to install it? It's basically saying that I decide that I want to have my cluster on Azure, okay? Good news, this talk was not yesterday. Otherwise, this will be a problem, okay? Yesterday, Azure was a huge problem. So you can decide if you want it on Azure, on AWS, and other places. So I decided that I want to have it on Azure. And what is inside of my Confluent um, Kafka cluster, okay? That's the next question. So. As I was showing you here on the 
diagram, I'm writing to this thing that I'm naming PRD patron events. So on that thing, it's basically a topic. Okay, what is a topic in Kafka? Let me show you here something that may help you. Okay, a topic in Kafka, you can think about it like a queue, but it's not a queue at all. Okay, it's an event log. Okay, it's a place where you will be always appending data. So the way that you write things into Kafka is always adding something to the end. Each entry on this event log has a number. Okay, we call that the offset. So. This is the detail that makes Kafka really efficient because the most, the cheapest um, option that you have to write data in software is appending, okay? You don't rewrite anything. And besides that, if you find out that you have an error on this message that is here on position five, you can change it, okay? It's immutable. What does that mean? If you want to do anything else, you just have one option, okay? Just append something to the end that will fix it like in accounting, okay, like you should do. So the other thing that is really cool about Kafka is that messages are always in order, okay? What does that mean? It means that if you want to know the state of your system, you have one option. You go for position one and you read till the end, okay? And you keep reading and you know the state. The other thing that makes Kafka really efficient is that it's, it's not like a queue because you, don't, you decouple completely the process of reading from the process of deleting data, okay? While in a queue you get a message and that message is not there anymore, on Kafka you read it, you do whatever you want with it, but it stays there. One day it may be deleted, it may be, okay? It's up to you, we'll talk about that later. And now there's this event log, okay? This log file, let's, let's call it a log file, okay? Each line of the log is, is part of our topic, it's a message. How does this relate to our uh, cluster? So let's take a look, okay? This is our cluster, okay? And here you find a concept that is a partition. So when you go to Kafka and you say, okay, please give me a new topic, it will ask you how many partitions do you want? What is a partition? Basically, I lied to you. The topic is not a file, okay? It's a distributed file, let's say. So each partition will live in a different broker. A broker is a kind of a server, a node in the cluster. And this gives you a lot of benefits. Why? Because Kafka is highly scalable, okay? So, so you can realize Kafka is used in organizations like Netflix, LinkedIn, uh, PayPal, on my YouTube account, all those huge corporations, as you can see. And when you define that you want multiple partitions, this will give the option of Kafka, to Kafka to host those partitions on multiple brokers. So you have a, a slice of that topic inside of a different machine. That gives you scalability in terms of writing, but also in terms of reading. What's the benefit? Now, you may be asking, why do I have, for example, partition one in blue on that side, and in orange here on the middle and here again. Because Kafka needs to have a way to make sure that it doesn't lose data, okay? And when you go and you write something to Kafka, Kafka will decide, okay, on which partition do I want to write this thing that Guilherme is sending to me? So I will write it on partition number two, okay? And now, let's say that the broker two has one problem and it goes away. So do I lose my data, okay? Possibly, uh, unless I, I have some configurations to avoid that. But one thing that Kafka is, keeps doing is using replicas. And what it, does that mean is that the data will be replicated from this side to the other ones, okay? You can think about this thing of the logs as like the transaction log from SQL Server, if you have ever used it, okay? You have a, a history of events that let you uh, fulfill those replicas. To the, re to the partitions on the top in blue, we call them leaders. To the partitions on orange, we call them followers. What does that mean? It means that if the broker two goes away, it dies for some reason, okay, let's say I'll, this machine is lost, what will happen is that Kafka will start a leader election process. So we will decide from the other ones who is the best candidate to now be the leader. What does that mean? Next time that I need to write or read data is with that one that I will communicate. 
So enough of concepts. Let's start to see some code, right? So clean up this thing. And let me scroll back into the left so we recap where we were. So remember that I told you that we have here an Azure function that has an HTTP trigger. And now I want to write into this thing. How can we do that? The most common approach is installing this package, confluent.net client. Okay? It's pretty fine. Nothing wrong about it. The problem is that if you build event-driven applications in a huge organization or in multiple applications, you will see that you keep rewriting the same kind of stuff. Okay? In top of, of the, Kafka, the Confluent Kafka client, you will do a lot of stuff over and over again. By the way, if you don't work with C Sharp, they also have uh, uh, versions for Java, Go, and other languages as well. So what I prefer to do is use this one that the name is Kafka Flow. And Kafka Flow has one advantage. By the way, it's built on top of Confluent uh, clients. So you keep using the one that I just showed you, but it gives you some things on top of it that will simplify your life. Okay? And we'll see a lot of them in a moment. The definition is clear. It's easier to maintain. It, it's a win-win, in my opinion. By the way, Always leave a start to, to open source projects. It's always helpful for uh, open source maintainers. It's a good thing to do. So Kafka Flow. Let's see how I'm using Kafka Flow. Visual Studio. Can everyone read this? OK. Yeah. I'm using the light mode just for the sake of presentation. But I think it it's reads better on this room. So here I have my HTTP trigger. As you can see, I'm not doing anything to it. I'm just getting the body as a memory stream, and I'm following to a different place in my application. And that different place, we take advantage of this thing that I will show you. So what have I done on this application? I have installed Kafka Flow. It's a NuGet package as well. And then what I do is that I will configure dependency injection. Okay? And I can do that on my program CS, startup CS, an extension method like I'm doing here, whatever you prefer. So the thing is, you have access to your iService collection. And now you start defining how is your relationship with Kafka. So I will say, OK, please add Kafka. I will select the login provider that I want to use. And then I will say, OK, please connect to this broker with this username and password. So to those two, I'm basically providing the credentials and the endpoints that Confluent Cloud gave me. Okay, basically that. If you are using your Docker localhost, just set localhost and the number of the ports. Then I need to, to go to our next concept on Kafka. So when we are talking about publish subscribe, anything that writes is a publisher, anything that reads is a subscriber. On Kafka, we give them we gave them different names. Okay? Something that will write data, we call them a producer. Something that will read data, we'll call them a consumer. Okay? Those are the two concepts that you must know. So if the data are coming in into the topic, someone is producing it. If the data is getting out of the topic, getting, it doesn't go anywhere, but someone is reading from there, it's a consumer. So what I'm doing here on using Kafka Flow is that I'm saying, OK, please add this producer with this name. This name will act as a key whenever I, I want that, OK? Whenever I want it, I will use this, this key to do it. Then I will say, every time that I use this producer, please write to this topic. If I prefer to overwrite this value when I'm sending the message, I can do it. And then I say, OK, since I don't have a lot of money, let's save some network cost and storage cost and use compression. So this is one thing that you can use with Kafka. There are several algorithms that you can pick. If you search online, you will see that there's always a trade-off between them. From my experience, gzip is the one that performs better when you need an, an overall performance of reading and, and writing. But if you prefer faster reads or faster writes, you can choose another algorithm as well. So, and it's as simple as going here and just select a different one, as simple as that. So I have now, this producer is completely configured. So through dependency injection, I've defined where it connects and what I need inside of this application. And what I am doing, I have also here 
through dependency injection, this patron publisher is the one that will be invoking the producer to send the message. But before that, I think it's important to see what a message is. So let me go here to a different place, and I will open uh, another application that is pretty cool if you want to use Kafka. Uh, I'm not affiliate to them. And if Azure is now back, I should be able to access it. Da -da -da -da. OK, we'll not be able to see that, and that sucks. So let's go through Confluent Cloud. It works as well. So let's go to the topics. OK, and let's open here a topic, messages. And now, one thing that happens with Kafka is that you need to say always, where do you want to start to read? OK? And this one has no message. Why, friend? It had yesterday. OK. Yeah. Yesterday, this was really this really sucks because of the thing that happened with um, with Azure, and I'm not sure if it's still recovering. To be honest, yesterday at night it was pretty fine. Okay, doesn't matter. Let me explain you that, and in a moment we'll get back to here to see. Okay, we have a message here. So a message will be something like, let's go and open. A message will have a value, okay, as you can see here. The value will always be something as like a binary data. Will not be, um, for example, enforcing you to be a JSON or a given type of data. You can send JSONs, you can send uh, things using Avro. Avro uh, is one of the most common protocols that you see when you talk about Kafka. Or, for example, you can use other things like Protobuf, whatever. For Kafka, it basically doesn't care. And that is one of the biggest advantages of Kafka. Why? You can see huge organizations using Kafka. And if you impose a given contract, a given protocol, what will happen is that one day, the data team will need to do something to connect to a different platform. And if you enforce them to be JSON, they will avoid it. And they will bring other technology into the house. That's one of the advantages of Kafka. Because you keep growing your business, adding stuff. And you keep using the same infrastructure for it. And that is awesome. The other thing that you can do is define a nether. A nether will always be a kind of a key value pair. Okay? You can define here things like message types. They are pretty useful for the serialization. You can send other things like um, uh, keys that you use for idempotency, those type of things. But also, you can define, this one is optional, a key. Okay? And when you define a key, one thing happens, and I will explain you with the source code. So let's go to this patron publisher. Okay. And on the patron publisher is the one where I'm getting through dependency injection, my producer accessor. That is the one that Kafka Flow is sending me. And I will say, OK, please get the one with that name that I told you, because I want to publish some messages. And now I go here and I say, OK, please produce a new message. And I want to produce with this key. The key is one important concept. Why? I can send a no value there. And if I send a no value, what will happen is, do you remember those partitions across the brokers? If I send a no, what Kafka will do is using a round robin algorithm to decide where that message should land. Okay? It will basically decide for himself where it should go. That's the best approach if you value throughput of your system. Okay? But then with that approach, you may have a problem. Why? The order of consuming messages is only guaranteed per partition. What does that mean? If I'm, imagine that I have two machines reading data from a topic, and I have the risk that one of them will be connected to one partition and the other to the other one. If I get two messages, one on this side and the other on this side, and they start to be processed in the wrong order, that may be a problem. Okay? Imagine on my case, I have a new patron, and it tells me, OK, I, I'm a new patron, my payment status is pending, and then I receive another event from the patron API that says, OK, this person is now uh, active. Okay? It already has paid. This is completely different if you swap around. Okay? I should do different things if I receive the pending after the paid. Right? So for me, it's really important to have order. And I can achieve that through the message key. When Kafka sees the same message key over and over again, it will always send it to the same partition. That way, I can ensure that my consumer 
we'll always get the messages regarding that patron in order. Okay? So this is one important concept to keep in mind when building these type of applications. Then what I'm doing on this case is, okay, so let's send a message into there. And besides that, let's set some headers. Okay? I'm setting here a header for the sake of uh, knowing on the other side, on the consumers, when Patreon has published this, uh, this event, okay? We call it a trigger, okay? It was a member created, a member updated, whatever. As you can see, I'm doing this thing that is sending bytes instead of a string. Why? As I told you, Kafka doesn't care about data types, okay? It works with binary data. Sometimes you will see through Kafka flow that you will be sending the, the data type, but in fact, I configure a serialization protocol to convert those things, and we'll see that in a different application. Okay, moving on. So next, next application, let's go here to our slides. Now I have a new patron, that patron was collected through this Azure function. Now I have a new event on the, the patron events. If we go down, what was my next step? Next step was this part here that you can see from ear to ear. So now that I have those events, I'm not doing anything to them, I'm not treating them. Now I want to treat them. Now I, I need to know what in fact is that thing. Because if you look into one of those events, what you will understand is that what, what patron is telling me, okay, I have this person that is your patron and I updated it. And now I need to look into the payload and find what happened, okay? I don't have semantics on top of that. So I need to understand if it was now if now it's a patron that is active, if it's someone that canceled the subscription, whatever. So what I will be doing is that I will have this patron manager that will be managing a catalog of the information, and then I will be publishing domain events that are useful for myself. One thing that I learned with this approach of having this thing here, as you can see, is that every single time that that thing on the top, the patron does crazy things, I can absorb them, and then I handle it. For example, I have the risk that they change the contract from one day to the other one, because the contract that is in the, on the documentation is not true. So I don't trust them. So this way, I'm sure that I will collect everything, and I will handle it later, okay? It's one good thing when you don't trust third parties. Now, I can convert that thing, and one thing that you can see on this application is that here, I'm not only uh, producing data into this application, right? I'm also consuming. What does that mean? It means that one application on Kafka can be a producer and a consumer, can be multiple consumers and multiple producers, whatever. You may have a lot of applications doing a lot of things with Kafka. So Kafka is not only for microservices, okay? By the way, by the end, you will understand that this is not a talk on how to avoid over-engineering, okay? I know that I have a lot of services here that maybe I didn't need it, but for the sake of the demo, I think it's pretty useful. So let's go take a look into this patron manager and see how I have it configured. So new application. And once again, you will see that most of the configuration is kind of the same. So I have here uh, extension method to configure dependency injection. And I'm using Kafka flow once again. But now I have one different thing that is one of the advantages of Kafka Flow. When you use the Confluent client, often, and you have one application that in the background is consuming things, often you need to implement a background service yourself. Uh, this way, just with this simple method call, you have it on Kafka Flow, so it's one small advantage. Then I'm saying more of the same, okay, what is my cluster, how to connect it, and now, we see a different thing. I add a consumer. On this consumer, I will need to say, connect to this topic. I will give it those names that we'll talk about it later. Now, I'm saying here a different thing that is one cool feature of Kafka Flow, that is, imagine having one application running .NET that is consuming event after event after event in a single loop, okay? You will look into that machine and you will see, okay, this machine is not seeing anything, okay? It's handling only one message at a time. Often you can scale out that thing inside of that application itself. So what Kafka Flow gives you on the, with this option is a multi-thread consumer, 
okay, inside of the same application, and even then it will preserve the order. Okay? You, you, it doesn't require you to scale out your server as a whole, okay, your application as a whole, you can only scale out through uh, threads. It's one small advantage as well. So, and then I'm saying, please, whenever you start for the first time reading this topic, please start from the beginning. Otherwise, what Kafka will do is just get you message from the end of the queue, okay? So, so you only see the new ones. But on Kafka, one cool thing is that you can always recover everything from the beginning. How is that useful? For example, I have developed the, that first part that I showed you first, so I collect some events. Then when I deploy this patron manager into production, it went there, it looked into everything that was there and rebuilt my store based on uh, storic data. One day when I decide to, for example, have a mailing list for my patrons, I can do the same. I just build one application that looks into events and read from the beginning and builds everything again. Okay? It's one of the huge advantages why many companies like Kafka. Okay. So, as I was telling you, I now I've registered all those things, and now here you can find one concept that if you ever used something like Mediator, this maybe will make a lot of sense to you. It's a common practice on this type of event-driven event or applications with comments. So, Kafka Flow gives you a middleware pipeline. It will let you register a set of things that will be executed in sequence when he receives a message. For example, in this case, what I'm telling him is, okay, please, whenever you see a new message coming from that topic, use this serializer, okay? I'm saying, okay, please use newtonsoft.json to deserialize that message, okay? I can use another one, like, um, as I told you, message pack. There, there are a huge offer inside of Kafka Flow that you can use. Once you get that type, I want you to use the type of the message to understand who should handle it, okay? And you will recognize that from Mediator as well. So I'm adding handlers into my application, and on that case, if it sees like a patron updated event, it knows that the patron updated event handler should handle it, okay? So that way I segregate the logic, and it's quite useful. Then I can say, okay, please, if you don't see anything else, just write a message for me, or I can send an alert, I can park that message somewhere, it's completely up to you. So now that I have this thing, let me show you what this is doing. That thing will call a process that will try to understand how to update the catalog with that, and then we'll decide to publish those events that I showed you here. Okay, so we'll write this thing here, and this thing here. This one that you see on the left are domain events for me, okay? New thing, uh, activated, deactivated, things like that. The one on the right is a snapshot of that user. And this will be useful by the end uh, when we get back to it. But for now, let's focus only on this one. But I, what I wanted to show you is that when I collect that data, I'm also finding the events that I want to publish and into multiple topics. And I can use one cool thing on Kafka that is batch processing, okay? As you can see right here. What does that mean? You can send one message, one call, with multiple things, and those things don't need to target exactly the same topic. You can see that I'm providing two different variables for different messages, and this way you can always decide between a trade-off on how the throughput of your application or, the, for example, um, the bandwidth that you want to consume, the latency of your solution as well, right? So it's another advantage of Kafka. And now I have done that, is that on, on my configuration through Kafka Flow, I went here and I have, as you can see, multiple consumers, but also a producer. This time, I'm using a diff, uh, the same compression algorithm, but I'm now using a, a middleware to serialize with uh, system.text.json on this case. And I'm also defining this X. What is this thing? Remember those those diagrams that I showed you with um, the brokers and the partitions and maybe one of the brokers goes away, how can I protect myself if I can't lose data? I can set this parameter, the acts or acknowledgements, to either none, what does that mean? I send the data into Kafka and I don't care about it. Okay, maximum throughput of the system, basically that. 
I can say, please let me know if the leader committed this thing successfully. Okay, so if it's on the leader, I'm okay and I keep moving on. Or I can say, if I can't lose anything at all, I can say, please just tell me that everything is fine whenever all the replicas and the leader uh, trust that they already committed the data into, into that, okay? So this is one of the things, one of the reasons why I see Kafka as a kind of a hybrid between a queue, a message system, and a database, because you have a lot of tweaks that you can do to have data to be really consistent on, on Kafka. So not saying that it's a database, okay? Don't get me wrong, but it's kind of in, in some aspects. So we have our producer, and now, Let's go here a bit to the end. And as you can see now, I'm using only the is activated events. So I have a new patron. The patron went to that first queue. Now I process that. And now I have semantics. Now I know that I have one event that is new patron uh, is activated. Okay. Now I know that I can give him access to GitHub. But I can't do it because from an email I can't Get, get, give him access. So what I will be doing is sending him an email, on this case through SendGrid, to, um, with a link that will guide him to a web page where he fills in the, the, username, the username, and I will relate those two things and publish to GitHub. But this brings me a problem. That is, Kafka has a concept of at least once message delivery. If I don't do anything, what may happen is that you start receiving a lot of emails from me saying, okay, please activate. That happened, okay? <laughs> this is a real story. And what can you do to, to do that? It's a, it's a simple thing that in fact you should do in most event-driven applications. Let me find one, okay, it's this one. That is using a, a logic on your system that will give you the item potency. So what I'm doing, I have this class that is using an Azure table, okay? where I use the patron ID and patron email to do duplicate messages, okay? You should always do that, especially on top of, of Kafka, okay? Because Kafka has this logic that it, it will make sure that you will get that message at least once, but at least once. So keep that in mind. Make your messages item potent. Uh, it was one huge problem that I had on the first run on this thing. So moving on. Now, as you can see, I've sent that email. This row, uh, arrow here represents the click on the email. Now this, the person goes to this web page. And this web page, now I have the username and the email. So why not adding it to GitHub? If I add it right there into GitHub, I can have a huge problem. That is, GitHub has, in the API has throttling. So uh, I have a, just a set of requests that I can do per hour. Okay. First time that I've done it, I, I have misconfigured my access key. So what can happen is that you have an error in configuration, or it may expire, something like that. And I can risk to lose that, that patron on that moment. Because imagine that you go there, okay, you want to get access to the source code, you fill in your username, you try, you get an error. You try back, you get an error, okay? And you say, okay, I will get back to it later. And you never go back. And now I lose your precious $3 um, that can help me. So I don't want that. So what you do on an event-driven system like this one is that you decouple the producing of messages from the consuming of those messages. So what I'm doing is, as long when I have that username, I will publish uh, a message into uh, a topic, a different topic, just saying, for this patron, now I have this username. And now you can see what I do. Now, on this side, you can see that from that one, I'm reacting to that message to update GitHub here on the top. But also, look that you, I not only have that arrow to here, so this consumer, but also this one. This is the type of thing that you can do with a typical queue, right? So you can not read the same message for two purposes. So what is happening here? Kafka as this concept, let me show you. If you go here to those two applications, you will see, and maybe you remember that I told you that I will talk about that later, that in one of them, I have this group ID. This, to this, we call the consumer group. So on one, I have this group ID. On the other one, on the patron manager, if we go here, I have a different group ID. 
By giving them two different group IDs, now they both can read two different messages, uh, the same message in, for two different purposes. I like to compare that to kind of reading a book with a bookmark, okay? This may be useful for you uh, to get the concept. Imagine the following scenario, okay? This book is designing products that people love, okay? And now let's say that this bookmark represents my daughter, okay? She's six, so she's really into designing products that people love. Uh, she doesn't know how to read yet, uh, but okay. Let's say that this represents her. So now I know on which page she's currently positioned. This one with Darth Vader and a Stormtrooper, it's mine, so I'm the dark force in my home, as you can see. This one represents where I am. What does this mean? The same book may be read by two different persons, right? But in fact, there's one other thing. Since my daughter doesn't know how to read, this uh, bookmark will be used not by her, but for her pur a purpose, okay? For her to uh, read the book through different consumers. And those consumers may be me, that today I read, and I will bookmark it, Tomorrow, my wife came into here and she reads two more pages and she will bookmark. When I get back to this thing, I know where she left off, okay? I don't need to read those two pages again. And this is how Kafka can really scale on this type of, of applications. So basically, what Kafka will be doing is keeping track of the offset. We remember the position on the topic is the offset you will keep track of that offset as a bookmark. But we'll keep track of that offset for this first application, but also to the other one, because they are from two different consumer groups. This way, if I decide to, for example, let's say that GitHub, through, through, due to the um, uh, throughput and rate limiting that, that we have, I can't scale up this thing at all, okay? Uh, otherwise, I will have problems. So I may have only one consumer for this one, but I can have two different consumers for this one. And they will not compete with each other, okay? One will get one message, other will get another one, and I keep scaling that way. It's beneficial on that way. Besides that, the, the bookmark is inside the book, okay? It's not with me, okay? I don't have a, a piece of paper with me saying on which page did I left the book last time. The same way with Kafka. What Kafka does is that it will store the, the offset for each consumer group, either on Zookeeper, that is another technology on Apache, but, or most recently, now we, we are able to store that inside of um, a topic in Kafka, okay? You don't need to do anything about that, but you will be doing that, okay? So that's another benefit. Let me see if I already can access this thing so I could show you that. If we can't, you need to trust myself. Okay, so maybe here we can see on the overview, consumption, and on consumer leg. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, look at this. What does this mean is that this topic that I'm showing you, that is a topic for development, has this client ID that in fact is a consumer or a consumer group that the last position is the offset number nine. What now Kafka knows is that if you are in, in page 100 and we have 200 pages on the book, you have a leg of another, uh, another 100 pages to read. It's the same concept on, on, the, on the topic, right? If you know that you have 20 messages and you are currently in the nine, it will tell you here that you have one, uh, 11 to read. So you can calculate the lag. And this is really useful for in, in systems that are huge, like the ones that Netflix and LinkedIn should have for, for sure. When you have a problem, you see that messages are not going through and you need to react to that. So you go to those dashboards and you can see what you, you, you need to do. You just scale out for, for a few minutes and then everything gets back. And it's a good tool to have. Okay. So, uh, what we have more? By the way, I used to work on a company where we had a process that would run every single Wednesday, I think so. And, on when, and for that process, it was really heavy calculation. It took a long time. And the problem is that at a given moment, we were almost always uh, missing an SLA that we had with our clients. So, 
on Wednesday, the person on support will go to, to some monitoring and will look into something like this to see, okay, do I need to scale anything to make sure that you will not miss the SLA? Okay? And when you have something like this, it's really useful to guide you on those decisions. Okay, so let's go back into our diagram. And now we know what is a topic, what is a producer, how we, what is a consumer, how to read and write data using C Sharp. I show you using Kafka Flow. If you want to use the, the Confluent client, it's kind of the same. The difference is that you'll be writing a lot of code yourself for small things like uh, uh, if you want to have multiple threads consuming, things like graceful shutdowns. The serialization sometimes gives a lot of work, but uh, it, it's easy, it's up to you. We talk about some of the most common concerns that you may have when you, you talk about Kafka, okay? So you may have now a clear picture of what does that mean. We have seen an architecture that follows basically the idea of an evolutionary architecture. What does that mean? It means that one day my business, me as a small content creator, uh, this thing may grow and I will start having access to different things. So if one day I need to have here on the side a different system that I want to give access, for me it will be as simple as adding another box here that will do kind of the same as this one, okay? And consume the same events to there with a side benefit that now I can consume everything from the beginning, okay? It's one extra benefit. The last thing that I wanted to share with you is regarding this one that I, on purpose, left for the end. Okay. Do you remember that I told you that Kafka can behave as a kind of an hybrid between a messaging system and a database? Why? When you write data into Kafka, or when you read data into Kafka, you don't do anything to the uh, lifetime of that data. Okay? The lifetime of data is configured through a retention policy. So when you create a new topic, let's go here into Confluent, topics, and now I have here an add topic button. It will ask me which name do I want to give to that topic. It will ask me how many partitions do I want, do, I want? do you remember that? And then I, need, I can change the cleanup policy of data. What does that mean? I can define, for example, in this scenario that after one week that data should go away. So those messages should go away after one week. If I want to have really good performance and keep that performance sustainable for a long time, I should have a kind of this thing, okay? Doesn't mean that needs to be one week. But it's up to you. You can define with your uh, requirements that you have. For example, imagine that you have a use case where that data due to things like GDPR and something like that, you need to throw it away after one year, after two years, something like that. This will do it for you. So you know that after that time, that event will go away. But also, you optimize your topic that way. You can do it through size, but the most curious option is this one, okay, the compact. And this one looks kind of strange when we, we think about it, because it looks like it's not Kafka. Why? The way that the compact will work is that it will look into the topic, and every single time that it finds out that it's the moment to get the, the compact working, okay, it needs to optimize that topic, you will look for events with the same message key, okay? Do you remember the message key is the one that we make sure that multiple messages are relatable, so they go to the same partition? So now it will look into those messages and will only keep the one with the highest offset. When is this thing useful? Imagine that you have a system where you want to publish a snapshot of the current address of your customers, okay? So every time that you have a new customer, you publish a message with that. In fact, the only address that matters is exactly the last one that you have, right, for the purpose of other applications. So what you do this way is that when Kafka decides to clean up data, instead of deleting old records, we'll only delete the old versions of that address. Okay, make sense? So you can use that. For example, in my case, uh, what I'm doing is that since I'm publishing a snapshot that says the name, the email, um, the GitHub username, and I think it's only that, I will not keep the, all the versions of that, but when the compact works, it will clean up the old versions of that thing. 
that doesn't mean that I only have one version of that patron inside of that topic, because the, the topic at the moment may not be compacted at all. Okay? It's something that may happen. So, okay, we have seen that. And now the last thing, as I told you, I wanted to find if I can give a price. But maybe none of you decide to become a patron, so this will go wrong for sure. Uh, but you'll find a way that I don't get back that thing to Portugal again. So what do I have here? I want to show you another option by this demo. I'm doing kind of the same thing. It's a, a console application, a simple .NET console application. And I'm installed Kafka Flow once again. And now what I've done is more of the same. Please add the cluster with this broker. I'll, I will authenticate it. And I'm saying, OK, please use a new consumer. Okay, you can see it right here. And this consumer will be looking to a topic that if you see on the name is my production patrons.tata.snapshot. So I may have duplicates inside of that thing. And besides that, I'm using a different group ID. Why? Because I want to treat this application uh, as a different purpose of consuming that data. And besides that, I only have one worker because I will run this uh, only at once. I don't need to, have to scale this thing. I'm saying, OK, please read everything from the beginning. I will add a, a middleware to deserialize data so I get the events uh, type. And then I'm saying, please use a, a batch processing that will get 100 and will wait just two seconds to see if something else comes into the, to the topic and then go, go to, to do whatever I want to do. For example, if you have a process that is always running, looking for data uh, to collect in batch, you can define here, for example, five seconds. It will wait five seconds seeing, OK, there's anything more, there's anything more. OK, I reached my limit, let's go. Okay? You can do th those kind of things. And then I'm saying, OK, please forward that watch into this middleware. The last thing that is really important is this one. I'm telling him specifically, please do not store offsets. What does that mean? Every time that you read a message and you process it, you need to, to set the bookmark inside of the topic, right? To know next time that you need to read that topic, you need to know where you left off. Kafka Flow will do that for you. So you don't need to think about that. You can always say, OK, I want to do that manually, and we will decide whenever you want to commit it or, or not. Or you can use this simple option that says, OK, please do, never do that. When does that is useful? On scenarios like this one, where I can run this demo multiple times, and I can load all the data, find a winner, and then I don't commit anything. So in an hour, when I decide to run this again, I will get every single thing once again. So it's one of the advantages. And then I don't do anything else here. So just this configuration. The application will start. I will receive my batch. And the batch will be forwarded to this middleware, where I'm accessing to the batch, as you can see. And besides that, I'm applying here a, a distinct to the batch, because I may have duplicated data there, since the compact may not have worked at, uh, at the time. Then I'm filtering out any patron from the past to find only ones from today. And then I will print the results. So let's see if this runs. And let's see if you decide to destroy my demo. I will not be surprised with that. Or this may not run because of all the problems that we had with Azure in the, in the last few days. OK. So it's starting. The first thing that we will try to do is to connect to, to the topic. OK. This does, usually doesn't take such a long time. But this is a demo. And when you go to a presentation and you say, yeah, I will not use slides, uh, this is what may happen. So <laughs> let's, let's hope that this, this time it, it will run. OK, okay here we go. So what he's saying now is, OK, I have connected to the topic. OK, and unfortunately, I have no one new there. So what will happen now is that since I don't want to bring a gift back to Portugal, if anyone approaches me by the end, the first one with a question will get something cool from Portugal. Okay? Thank you all for taking the time to be here with me today. I really hope that you learn something new uh, on this session. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Please don't forget to leave your votes on the way out. And remember that we have the longest alliance in the world. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>
Goodbye.